Okay, we're a little behind schedule, so I'd like to get us going. Um, I'd like to call the June Capital Program Committee meeting to order. Do we have members of the public? Yes. Uh, providing comments? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. We have four members of the public making comments today. We have one in person and three are virtual. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers please adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware there will be a warning beep letting you know that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. Our first in-person speaker is Lisa Dagligan. Good afternoon. I am Lisa Dagligan, Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA or PCAC. You're doing a tremendous amount of work, as we saw in some detail at the Transit Committee meeting. Today's announcement about the plan to move forward with improvements to Penn Station that focus on the station and on the station now uh, and the riders who will benefit from it, uh, it really adds to the amount of work that you're doing and the millions of people who depend on the transit system every day. Accessibility projects, come on, Metz will its point, new signals and, and equipment, investing in the basic infrastructure that support the system, and expansion projects like IBX and Penn Access are essential to ensuring that we have the 21st century system for our 21st century region. But money makes those projects go around, and that truly highlights the importance of funds that congestion pricing will bring. As we await an announcement of its approval any day now, we still hear from our neighbors in New Jersey who decry the potential effect on them. To the contrary, a better MTA will make for a better commute for New Jerseyites and Connecticutians, not to mention the increasing number of regular riders on subways, buses, Metro North, Long Island Railroad, and, St and Staten Island Railroad. We applaud your focus on building quality projects that will make a difference in the lives of riders and urge you to keep your eye on the bottom line and encroachment of red ink and delays and inequality related issues. We also ask that you consider whether there are any capital approaches to combating subway surfing, innovative ways to prevent these horrific and growing life and death deeds. Thank you. Thank you. Our first virtual speaker will be Jason Anthony, followed by Alita Dupree. Uh, good afternoon, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, Jano. And good afternoon, Jamie. Jason Anthony here from home on the Monday after my 37th birthday. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge the passing of Dr. H who was the head of capital construction before you, Jano. He passed away, unfortunately, this past uh, weekend. He was the one who opened Second Avenue Subway Phase 1. Uh, we are saddened by his uh, passing. But uh, moving on, uh, it is great that we will have updates regarding uh, CBTC. It is way overdue, especially on the Crosstown line that I use uh, frequently to go to LaGuardia College, uh, especially on the Colbert line, a 5 line, where we have uh, experiencing meltdowns on QBL. Uh, we need uh, accessibility uh, work on stations, especially at Metz Willis Point on, on the same line where uh, Lisa Daglian uh, mentioned. Uh, we need pen access uh, I and other projects that will benefit uh, our region. So that, that's all I have to say for this month, General. Thank you. Thank you. Alita Dupree. Um, thanks again. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Chair General Lieber. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her, uh, as I speak to you about capital, I was looking through the 
chart in the agenda. There's lots of things there uh, making sense of it all. Um, a lot of CBTC work and ADA work, all kinds of important things. Um, I, I feel that we do need to uh, revive the central branch electrification plan so we can close that gap and be able to uh, provide more electrified service uh, to Babylon by way of the main line and the uh, three track system. That gap is long overdue. So, so we should do something about that. And uh, how do we build uh, the most reliable uh, electrical system uh, for the subway? And I'm seeing that, and the railroad, and I'm seeing that we have some of those items in the agenda. Uh, but I, I think that there, there's more to be done. And um, I consider the idea of, of MTA becoming its own uh, electric company and having our own transmission systems and even having uh, our own uh, renewable uh, energy uh, production so we can build uh, the most sustainable system um, that we can. And uh, Omni is, is essential, that, that's part of capital. And I mentioned in uh, other committees about uh, using the, the tap to pay on the capital corridor in the Bay Area of California. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say today. There's a lot to be done and we need to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. The final speaker is Charlton Sousa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Charlton D'Souza, president of Passengers United. Um, and what I want to know is, what is the status of the Hollis LIR station? I know every time I keep asking about it, the MT tells me it's in design. It's in design. So can you guys please show us the designs and talk about this today at the meeting to explain to us where it is, when is it going to get built, and what's needed to get it done? Because that's all I've heard for the last two years. It's in design. And you guys want to implement congestion pricing, right? What about East New York? That station is hasn't been done. What about Hunters Point Avenue? You know, what about all these other stations that are in neglect? Like um, if you look at what's going on on the main line, um, that's also an issue with Floral Park. So these stations all need to be fixed up. Um, no station should be left behind. And uh, in terms of 179th Street on the F line, you know, when the storm came in, the power got knocked out and they're still having power issues there. Are they going to fix the 179th Street and Hillside Station? And um, in terms of Jamaica Center, it's so dark over there. Is there a way that they can put in white tiles so that it's brighter in there when you're coming into the station? But they really need to improve uh, capital construction because so many people depend on the MT and especially Southeast Queens, we're a transit desert. Now, in terms of the Montauk branch and the diesel branches, they need to buy new diesel trains. That should, that should have been done five years ago so the diesel trains can be delivered now because it's going to take you guys another six years to, you know, purchase the diesel trains and get them into service. So I'm concerned that service, you know, you're going to have more breakdowns and there's only so much of repairs that can be done to a diesel train before it really goes out. So you'll need to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, that concludes the public comment session. Thanks, Liz. Um, copies of the May Capital Program Committee minutes have been distributed and are available on the website. Are any changes or comments on the minutes? Mr. Albert. Thanks, Jano. Uh, on page five, um, under MTA rolling stock update, um, you spent, it mentions mean distance between failure, but in parentheses it has MDFB instead of BF. And then, on page 16, um, completed station survey, it's got Beeford instead of Bedford. Okay. All right. Assuming the typos are corrected, may I have a motion to approve? Second? All in favor? Any of opposition? The minutes are approved. Uh, any changes to the work plan? There are Mr. no Dear. changes to the work plan. Okay. Um, let's go to the president's report. Uh, I want to 
highlight a couple of things at the front end. Though. I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you do that, Chair. I just want to say, um, as we start, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This photo shows the view of the F train from the King's Highway Station. And in addition to signal modernization work that you're going to hear about today, <clears throat> we've worked closely with our partners in New York City Transit in much closer to coordination to uh, provide for station renovation opportunities to make the most out of weekend outages as we do the CBTC work. So we're excited uh, about the coordination um, that, that we're doing to maximize uh, those precious outage resources throughout the system. And uh, go, okay. go ahead. Uh, listen, it's the Capital Program Committee meeting, and um, this is the, one of the right moments to acknowledge that we lost somebody who devoted an enormous <laughs> amount of his career and his energy and his passion to, uh, to the MTA Capital Program, Dr. Michael Haradnachano. Um, I went to his funeral last week, uh, a couple of other ex-MTAers, uh, a, lo a lot of folks who, who were still at the MTA and, and former MTA, including uh, ex-chairs Walter and Prendergast were there. Um, it was a lovely service that talked a little bit about Michael the man, but I think we need to acknowledge that in the time that he led MTAs, uh, what was then called MTA Capital Construction, he did leave a significant mark on this institution shepherding projects like the Hudson Yards extension, the number seven extension, Second Avenue, phase one, the Fulton Transit Center uh, to, to completion. And uh, as I took over from him, uh, he was enormously gracious and helpful in, in uh, making sure that, you know, that, that I was ready uh, to the best of his capacity to, uh, to take over ownership of some of those projects that were unfinished. Uh, and he left a great staff in uh, in place um, to build on, and and some of those are are sitting at the table here today. So I just want to acknowledge he was a, a great spirit and passionate about New York infrastructure, and um, somebody who's not going to be forgotten at the MTA or in New York for forever. Mr. Mr. Jones, I'd, I'd like to join in this. Uh, Michael was a personal friend uh, before he came here. Uh, actually, my son interned for him, and we were social friends, but he was also on the board of the Community Service Society, which I've led. Um, one of the, he was also very funny. <laughs> His comments of the, gov the former governor calling him up at early in the morning <laughs> about dust on the station were some of the funniest commentaries I've ever heard. But he, he was really, his family and he were really beautiful people. So I'd like to join in a, the memorial for him. Thanks. And uh, um, we'll, we'll continue to honor his memory in, all, in, in lots of different kinds of ways. Uh, Jamie? Yeah, I, I do. All, I will also just want to acknowledge Dr. H, who was also um, very uh, gracious and helpful to me as I took this position. But also I knew him for years as a real leader in the public construction uh, you know, in public development industry in the city. And I, I would say, you know, just, just, uh, just note that uh, I'm good friends with, um, with his uh, daughter-in-law, Kate Orff, who's married to his, his son, Odette, who's, uh, who's a great guy, follow, really following Dr. H's footsteps. Kate told me that even in the last days of his, uh, his illness and decline, he was still arguing with her about what to do with the Brooklyn Queens Expressway and various other projects. So he had a real spirit um, until the very end. Um, and, uh, and, and on to our report, unless, uh, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. Just, we, 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 ha we had intended to talk about uh, former chairman uh, Dick Ravitch. I think we handled that earlier. And I just let everybody know that from what I understand, the funeral is on Wednesday morning. And, mm -hmm. and many of us are, are, are going to represent the MTA there because he was such a big part of the MTA's history and New York's history. So with that, let's get to the business of the committee meeting. Thanks. Uh, turning to this month's updates, we were pleased to reopen the elevators at the Court Street R station earlier this month. Uh, replacements like this are critical to keeping our system running. And we're making progress on new ADA projects, too. I'm very excited uh, to announce to the committee that just today, the RFP for the Broadway Junction ADA project, uh, which will really convert three major stations, the A, C, J, Z, and L stations, looking over at Andrew to make sure I got that right, um, to, to full ADA accessibility. And 
Um, I, I, you know, I was privileged to, uh, to be with the mayor in Broadway Junction uh, last month as we announced the combination of that investment, other investments that the city is making, um, new development projects that will bring jobs and housing uh, to this portion of, of East New York. And of course, we couple that in the long term with the vision of the Interborough Express uh, moving through this portion of the neighborhood too, overcoating that we're doing uh, to really improve and sustain uh, the quality of the, the, um, uh, the line structures there. There's a lot of work uh, that, that is really touched off by this, and we're excited that we're moving forward with this major project. And stay tuned uh, next month for further ADA updates during Disability Pride Month, although I do want to note that um, our uh, uh, commuter railroad uh, ADA work uh, continues apace. Um, we'll be hearing shortly from Tim Mulligan on the capital plan amendment. Um, part of what that's doing is ensuring we have the funding in place uh, to, um, to get uh, the Hollis Station uh, made ADA accessible. We expect to award a package uh, with Forest Hills, Hollis, and uh, work on the Babylon Station um, uh, this year. So, uh, so we, we, uh, we have all uh, Long Island Railroad Station uh, ADA accessibility in, uh, at some level of progression, and much of it is moving forward, uh, and we're excited about that, Mr. Alburn. Yes, um, in your mention of the Hollis Station, in addition to the ADA, the, the platforms are going to be extended, I assume, because they are the shortest in the system, I believe. That's now. right. You got it. Great. Thank yeah. you. Um, I also wanted to mention the committee that at finance, the finance committee will be bringing an agreement that we've reached with Amtrak uh, for the board's uh, consideration and approval. This agreement will allow Amtrak to build the third segment of a concrete casing underneath the Long Island Railroad West Rail Yard, as you can see here. Trains will, will be using that casing uh, coming from the future Gateway Tunnel to get to Penn Station. So we're very happy to coordinate uh, with Amtrak to uh, support the important Gateway project. Um, uh, and we have ensured that our assets are protected. And a couple things I wanted to point out here in the Capital Committee, uh, ways that we've done that, we've coordinated with them to make sure that the future flood wall that we intend to build around the yard um, uh, will be coordinated with Amtrak's work. Uh, and we've received a commitment from Amtrak to protect the yard or be liable for damages if their work on the concrete casing were to delay completion of that flood wall. Uh, I'm also pleased that we took the opportunity with Amtrak to reach an agreement on carrying liability insurance more in line with what the market requires when we're working in Amtrak's territory in the future, including all future work in Herald Interlocking. And we expect that's going to save the MTA significant additional capital funds in the future in the face of rising insurance costs, as we've discussed at this committee in the past. Uh, finally, you, you may have noticed, I think it was mentioned in uh, public comments, that uh, Chair Lieber and the governor and a number of elected officials um, just a couple of hours ago made an announcement at Penn Station um, that we are issuing the notice to proceed uh, and officially entering the design phase for Penn reconstruction. You can see as we're starting to produce some new conceptual renderings uh, of, of the mid-block train hall in this case, what a transformational opportunity we are pursuing to fix Penn now for the predominance of our 600,000 daily riders uh, within the station. One thing I wanted to note uh, as you look at this rendering, obviously there's a lot we can talk about in terms of uh, Penn reconstruction, but you can see the recently completed gateway entrance at 33rd Street and 7th Avenue in the foreground on the left side of the image, and really the Long Island Railroad concourse is at the left side of this image. That concourse is built and it will remain uh, in place uh, as the first step. It's the first 20% of Penn reconstruction, and now we'll be proceeding with the other 80%. It doesn't uh, require rebuilding the Long Island Railroad concourse. That will remain in place, and then um, uh, we'll be building the, the, uh, the additional uh, project to serve um, those riders in the station. Turning now to our main topic of discussion today, Signals and Train Control uh, Business Unit. Last year, uh, as the committee will recall, we undertook a strategic review of our moderniz signal modernization program to address challenges with existing projects, to reform procurement, uh, and improve our technical approach to the new projects going forward, and to take program-wide steps to maximize the benefit of CBTC, the signal modernization across the system. I'm very pleased with the progress that our business unit has made on each of these fronts. We'll be talking about that today. 
but we are steadily moving uh, what is a complicated set of projects that are in construction, including uh, Queens Boulevard Line West, the 8th Avenue Line, and the Culver Line, uh, plus uh, additional projects that are just starting work. We're steadily moving those forward in a more organized way and uh, enhancing reliability uh, day by day as we go. Um, we also uh, are very excited in terms of reforming uh, procurement and the approach to new projects to be talking about the Crosstown project, the G train, which was awarded at the end of last year. That's C and D, C and D's first CBTC project, and it's our first design build CBTC project. And as uh, Gregoire and Dan will be talking about, um, we approach that project by really making onboard CBTC signals the priority within the project and the lead in the project so that we're managing this high technology project in a much more focused way, um, which is exciting to show those results. And also we're getting organized program wide. And I think one of the great things is the partnership that we've established with New York City Transit. Um, it's, uh, it's evolving, but we're putting the staff in place and uniting the staff in a way that we can manage that transition to full operations uh, and get everyone comfortable with managing a new modernized signal system. So lots to talk about today. And with that, I want to pass it on to uh, Dan Creighton and Gregoire Soumont, who are the um, co-business unit leads for, uh, for our signal uh, program. Thank you, Jamie. Good afternoon. Before discussing the technical and strategic advances that we have made in our train control uh, program, we want to quickly update you on the ongoing projects. You will hear from the IEC in further detail on these projects. But to be quick, um, CBTC has been in full operation on the QBL West Line, the E, F, M, and R lines in Queens since 2022. However, there are many outstanding features that have not been delivered, and the system does not yet meet by far the availability targets. We have been working with Siemens, executive management in France, Germany, and the U.S. to address this situation. They have increased support by adding senior staffing to the project team. The focus on the project will continue until all of the contract objectives have been met, and a detailed plan going well into 2024 has been established. While we are seeing positive results, including a 50% reduction in incidents, there is still a long way to go. We have also made advancements on the Culver Line, the F Line in Brooklyn. In particular, we have advanced the specialized ties for the track work uh, part of the project. As previously reported, the designs had to be corrected and new ties fabricated, leading to cascading delays. Those replacement ties have now been received and successfully installed with the track work now substantially complete at Ditmas Avenue. This roadblock has been lifted and the project is now moving forward. The 8th Avenue project equips the A, C, and E lines in Manhattan, and it's on track since the last report and has been saving substantial money in the Force Account area. The project continues to monitor the delivery of the 211 trains, which come CBTC equipped. Further delays in delivery of these cars could impact substantial completion. QBL East, which extends CBTC service in Queens for prim primarily the F line, is also on track. An integrated schedule for the three contracts has been received, and Mitsubishi has successfully completed their initial factory testing of the zone controllers. We have a path forward on each of these projects, which the IC agrees with. In December, we awarded the Crosstown project to Crosstown Partners. We are currently in procurement for the Fulton CBTC line project, which will be followed by the 6th Avenue and 63rd Street CBTC project. The Crosstown project is the first CBTC contract to be awarded under our new train control strategy. As Jamie mentioned, we've changed our procurement approach from a design bid build approach to a design build contract. We have also included long-term maintenance and support in the procurement and minimized the amount of non-signal scope. We're working to simplify the system, giving the suppliers the ability to propose alternative solutions while reducing the amount of legacy wayside equipment. I will now turn it over to Greg Ward to discuss some of the technical and strategic advances we have made. Greg? Um, good, um, good afternoon. Uh, let me explain what we are doing to simplify the system. We moved on from a two-step deployment approach. We no longer require the legacy, uh, the legacy wayside signaling system to be installed first. 
we will now install CBTC systems that will directly control the switches on the signals. This eliminates one layer of equipment. This simplified site instruction results in reversible cutovers that do not require intensive track work, making it less risky, faster, and more cost effective. To highlight some, to highlight some met key metrics related to the Crosstown project, we have been able to reduce the number of rooms to six. This is despite the fact that the Crosstown project has more interlockings and covers double the length of the 8th Avenue project and triple that of QBL East. This reduction has a direct impact on the cost of the project. An overall gain of approximately 25% is estimated. As just mentioned, the relay rooms themselves are no longer going to be large and complex area that must be built out at stations, but simple, modern rooms fit with equipment designed for field installation. The comparison above shows an example of the design of the rooms of our previous CBTC project, specifically 8th Avenue. As you can see, the new CBTC room layout at the bottom is much smaller with much less equipment, which saves us time, money, and disruption. We are also making program-wide advances. We have made part of our recent procurement, the upgrade of our integrated testing facility. We are updating it to a cloud-based solution that will have the, the ability to be used by all the vendors to simulate the software solution for, all, for on future projects. This is going to be critical to handle the increased complexity of the system as CBTC expands further. We have also upgraded our CBTC radio from a legacy proprietary radio operating in a public band to a new IP-based radio utilizing 5G technology in an existing MTA-licensed band. This will provide state-of-the-art mobile communication and cyber security for the Crosstown and all subsequent projects. We have also started designing a solution to equip the work trains to further reduce the amount of legacy wayside equipment. This was funded through the recent plan amendment. Finally, we have completed a request for information to explore potential simplification to retrofit the existing A division fleet. We are actively discussing with the industry. NYCT and CND have jointly reviewed in detail the experience from London, Copenhagen, and, pra and Paris. Similar to the New York City subway, these transit agencies have a brownfield CBTC program. We all experience the same difficult stabilization periods. But at the end, the rewards are worth the effort. The key lesson is that this learning curve must be proactively managed. We also received the confirmation that from this agency that our strategic actions presented earlier are in line with the global trend. By following this path, we will deliver CBTC projects better, faster, and cheaper. Now I will turn it over to the IEC. And, um, Joe, just if, I, just if I may, and Chair, I, I, just I just can't help but I, I just want to emphasize a couple of the things that Gregoire mentioned. So, you know, just the, uh, the amazing work on improving technology and the way that this is delivered. I mean, the, the sort of, you know, the relay room down to the cabinet, basically, I mean, it sort of reminds you of the transition from old school IBM mainframe computers to, you know, the phone that we all carry in our pocket. I mean, that's really, but doing that within the subway system where it's so incredibly disruptive to have to build out a relay room within a station or near a station, um, it's just it enormously simplifies the uh, delivering a project. And I also have to say that, uh, Gregor went over it quickly, but the CBTC radio modernization 
Um, the fact that we were able to move to an IP-based 5G system but use a band that the MTA already controlled, initially we thought we were going to have to spend millions of dollars a year on acquiring a new band, and it's a real, it's not only sort of an innovation and a great thing that we're proud of, but also it's one of the reasons that C and D was created, because I won't get into all the details, but it really, it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have gotten to that point without our contracts and procurement folks, our development group, uh, and our business unit within delivery all working together to try to come up with a creative solution to that. So, um, so some of what's happening, it'll bear fruit over time in terms of customer reliability, right, you know, rider reliability, but we're very proud of the direction that things are headed. Thank you. And good afternoon. Uh, with the inclusion of our first report on the Crosstown line, the IEC is reporting on five CBC projects today. The four projects we last reported on in November 22 remain in various stages of construction and form the basis for the evolving MTA signal approach known as the Interoperability Interface Standard or I2S. Compared to a fixed block system, the CBTC program has three primary objectives which are to be achieved upon completion of the projects. Those being provide train control systems with improved safety, providing increased capacity, and improving operational flexibility. Since November, CD has completed validation of interoperability between Siemens and Talos on the QBL West line, stabilized the Culver project schedule, maintained the QBL East project baseline schedule, and advanced preliminary design activities on Crosstown. The project details in the IEC recommendations are spelled out in our reports, which begin on page 17 of your book. Here are some highlights of the five individual projects. On the QBL West project, as previously reported to the board, all sections of the QBL West project were placed in CBTC operation in early 2022. This was followed closely behind by substantial completion of the Talus Design and Furnish and the LK Comstock installation contracts. The Siemens contract is projected for completion in December this year, a slip of six months since our last report due to a longer than planned resolution of technical issues. What remains to be done on QBL West includes providing stable CBTC performance, resolution of communication and onboard issues, implementation of automatic train operation, provision of all ATS functions, and achieving contract reliability, availability, and maintainability requirements. Regarding its budget, since our last report, the budget was increased to cover overruns and force account costs. The estimated completion is currently at $743 million, but may increase further in accordance with the revised substantial completion date of December 23. While additional improvements are needed, Siemens and Talus have successfully tested coupling of their respective train units and placed the Talus equipped trains in revenue service in May of this year. This completes a contract requirement for interoperability verification and validation, certainly a major project achievement. And this concludes comments on QBO West. On the 8th Avenue project, overall this project is 71% complete with project completion planned for October 2025. Our review of the project schedule indicates a full month delay since last report due to a design change to provide adequate signal protection for unequipped trains at the 42nd Street interlocking. Also, delivery of the 300 R211A cars needed for CBTC testing planned for August of 24 continues to be an issue and could eventually impact the project. Regarding budget, the project budget remains at $828 million and an estimated completion is currently $791 million, which reflects a reduction of $37 million in the overall cost of New York City Transit Supplied Services. IEC agrees with the CND on costs and find there are sufficient funds to complete the current scope of work. Recently, the CND team identified issues with the axle counter system being used on this project. These issues could result in an axle miscount that could impact operations. The project team is working closely with the contractor to resolve these issues and to test all train types. The IEC expects these solutions will be applied to later CBTC projects to ensure that these issues do not occur again and do not delay other completions. On the Culver line, the project is 87% complete and remained within the original budget of $482 million. While there were significant earlier delays, during this reporting period, the project team was able to stabilize the schedule and is now forecasting a two-month schedule reduction to August of 2024. The IEC concurs with C&D on this schedule revision. 
CMD agreed with the IEC recommendation to perform radio frequency interference tests. If the test results show areas where interference is present, mitigation measures may be necessary to achieve stability. These tests should be conducted as soon as possible following any required predecessor work to allow the contractor time to identify and implement mitigation measures found to be necessary. On QBL East CBTC, this project which was awarded in December 2021 is 28% complete and remains on schedule with a CBTC in-service date in January of 2026. As previously reported, the total budget and estimated completion for the project currently remain at $542 million. However, there's an indication additional funds might be needed to cover the cost of New York City Transit services for the use of bus during certain diversion, buses during certain diversions. The IC concurs with previously mentioned cost and schedule data. The task order for the supply of DCS equipment was finalized in April of 23, and while delayed, had no impact on the schedule as the project team arranged for Siemens provided support to, to for the project during the negotiations. Mitsubishi, the CBTC supplier, has performed well to date, and its technical team has de demonstrated a good understanding of the requirements and working in a New York City transit environment. Factory acceptance tests for its zone controller equipment have already been successfully completed. Early project risks identified in the November report have been mitigated, and the IEC is pleased to report that the QBL East project is progressing in accord with the CT CBTC program plan. On the Crosstown CBTC project, this is the first design build CBTC project that was mentioned. NTP was given in January of this year with a contract duration of 57 months. The total and budget at, com as the, at completion for the project are $620 million. With respect to the schedule, the critical path runs through the train control system design, followed by procurement installation, testing, and cut over the CBTC system. Development of the signal block design is needed for subsequent design and construction activities. Design issues have been identified which are being addressed through working groups at the project level. But there is a risk of the act activity impacting final design, which is critical and must meet all New York City transit safety and operational requirements. This is the first use of 5G technology for CBTC communications at MTA. CND has successfully mitigated, mitigated impact of the project by utilizing the existing MTA license frequency band in lieu of purchasing a band saving MTA both time and money, as Mr. Jamie Torres Sprint just mentioned. And lastly, the project risk assessment is ongoing. And upon acceptance of the design build baseline schedule, risk workshops with participation from most stakeholders are planned. And that concludes our IEC reports on all the CBTC projects. A uh, lot of information here. So, uh, you know, and a lot of it's technical. But I think that what your, my overall take on this for what it's worth is a lot of positive innovation going on in reducing the scope and the complexity of these projects that's evident on the Crosstown. Stay, you know that solid schedule management on the on on the Eighth Avenue project, which still has risk, principally associated with the uh, with the car deliveries. It's no secret we're struggling with the the Kawasaki car deliveries. That's become the principal risk. The project is it seems to be uh, uh, maintaining schedule. Otherwise, stabilization of the cul the, the Culver line, the F train in Brooklyn which struggled at the beginning, this is some years ago, really struggled at the beginning to, um, because they screwed, the, the, the contractor frankly screwed up the, uh, the, cable, so the cable order, and there was some special track work, what? The, the, the ties, and there was some special track work um, that needed to be redone. That was a major foul up that the project has been working to overcome, but has consist has stabilized the schedule and now maintained the schedule for some time. Uh, and continued struggle with, with frankly, in the QBL, uh, 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 the, the QBL West project, um, which is no secret. The Talus piece of that project has been successfully implemented. This, this is the first interoperability project where you're having two different contractor systems being joined in a single project, um, and that has clearly uh, been a struggle uh, on the Siemens side. Um, but the big picture is, I th you know, this is my observation, having sat a little bit where Jamie is, um, 
that there are, there are significant positive steps, especially with respect to trying to simplify scope so that projects can be managed more successfully. I just needed to share that with the board, but I'm sure there are questions. Andrew. Yeah. Um, when you showed work equipment uh, on one of the slides before, are we still considering the use of ultra-wideband frequency, which can get installed on the work equipment much more quickly and more cheaply? It can be put on any piece of equipment, actually, and it works fine with CBTC. We want to see if our business unit leads would like to talk about use of ultra-wideband. Um, I, I think uh, the answer is that the decision is not made. It's the door is open. So, we're, yeah, we're continuing to study it. Um, and it does have application uh, as a technology throughout our system. I, I, I will say we've got some uh, positive direction uh, with our the technology we're currently using on work trains and otherwise. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board? A lot of information. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. DeVito. Thank you, Gregoire. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, next topic. Um, I think with that, we're uh, moving to the plan amendment, Chair. So um, uh, our Deputy Chief Development Officer, Tim Mulligan, and Chief Financial Officer, Kevin Willens, uh, will make a presentation on the capital plan amendment. So today we're going to discuss the 2024 capital plan program amendment number three. Um, as everyone knows, uh, the historic uh, capital plan is well underway and ramping up in a dramatic scale. This, uh, this graphic captures our commitments over the last three years. Um, and of course, those commitments are cumulative between the 2024 capital plan and prior programs. So we had a significant uh, carry forward that we had to work through uh, early, early in the program. But uh, the, the historic number of 11.4 was almost uh, overwhelmingly predominantly 2024 commitments last year. We are on pace to be 50% committed of the 2024 plan by the end of this year, hitting our uh, $10 billion 2023 target. And uh, it's, excuse me, in, a, in addition to just the dramatic pace of that ramp up, we're also saving money and saving time. This chart highlights some of the uh, savings, both from design build projects, as well as A plus B projects, and saving not just on the construction bid and the construction costs of the third party contracts, but also saving on the force account, which was referenced today, as well as significant savings in some of the administrative support costs, like the insurance savings that, uh, that was uh, discussed with the board some months ago. Uh, we're also advancing uh, the and reducing the duration of projects. Uh, both through uh, different delivery models through design build as well as A plus B. So moving faster uh, and doing better. Um, as you know, we, we do capital program amendments with some regularity um, as projects develop and conditions change in the capital program. Uh, the Crow audit recommended annual amendments. We were back here uh, in July of last year to do the second amendment, and so we're we're here a year later to do uh, the Third Amendment. Primarily, this amendment, we'll get into the details, provides funding to advance critical uh, expansion projects, uh, primarily Second Avenue Subway Phase Two and uh, the, the Pin Access Project. It also uh, allows us to take advantage of certain timing opportunities to uh, accelerate key core infrastructure projects that we'll highlight specifically in a moment. Uh, it also addresses the, the ameliorate of uh, housekeeping issues, uh, you know, cost changes, cost increase, scope adjustments uh, that, we, that we experience as projects evolve, get awarded, we receive bids and award contracts. And uh, the context for this amendment, though, and we'll, we'll get into this in more detail, is, is really taking place um, in, in the context of a pending, a, a major pending federal grant application we have to tap into one of the major new funding streams of the Biden infrastructure bill, the Fed State Partnership Program, which we have an 80% uh, grant application for federal funding for the Pin Access Project. And uh, we, don't, we expect the results of that in the fall if we're successful uh, and, and receive the full 80. Um, and even if we receive a smaller portion, that will allow us to sort of uh, repay some of these uh, 
donations or movements that we're doing to facilitate expansions. And I'll talk about that in more detail. So uh, Second Avenue Subway Phase 2, we all know about the project. The changes in the amendment are driven by the federally required increase in our contingency funding in the project. So our funding partners are requiring us to put in uh, additional contingency, and, and that's what's driving the need to sort of reallocate some money to that project so that we can move forward uh, with, uh, with awarding the early works later this year and, uh, and moving into procurement for the boring and tunneling contract uh, this year as well uh, with subsequent award next year. Um, and pin access project, which we've talked about in prior plan amendments, um, just to refresh your recollection from last July, we funded the construction of that project in total. We came back and funded the yard needs and two out of the three needs for rolling stock. And this just puts another $200 million in uh, as, a, as a down payment towards those coach needs, which are the remaining rolling stock need for that project. Some of the key infrastructure projects that are being accelerated uh, in this project include uh, the Metro North Park, Park Avenue Viaduct project. Uh, as you're aware, we awarded uh, what we call the first phase. That was actually phase one and two as originally designed uh, for that project. This project was going to be spread over three phases over three different capital projects. And we were able to combine phases one and two and award a design build contract for that. This will allow us to actually go into procurement to add that third phase, which is now phase two. Um, and we'll be able to do all three phases of the project in this capital plan. So that just you know goes to show the opportunities we take uh, to sort of move funding around where it can be most utilized uh, most efficiently to advance work. We're also adding a brand new project for B&T on the Verrazano Bridge, the main cable dehumidification project. This extends the useful life and the structural integrity of the main cable, which as you uh, bridge architect aficionados may know is the basically the spinal cord uh, of any bridge. And so maintaining and extending its life is crucial and a very high priority uh, to us and B&T. It also allows us to uh, move forward with uh, New York City transit elevated structure steel repair and coating projects. Um, these are projects where the price point has increased significantly, but it's increased because we've ad identified state-of-the-art specifications that actually came from B&T, which will uh, greatly extend the useful life of that work so that we'll get a, a, a near doubling of the useful life of those steel repair and coating projects. So. Uh, so that requires some, some movement of money. And as, uh, and as uh, was discussed earlier today as well, uh, it adds the construction of the Hollis Station ADA project and platform lengthening to the project, to the plan. Previously, the plan was going to afford only the design. Now it will afford the design and the construction as well. Um, so, so this table really shows you the overview of, uh, of the plan amendment, the third plan amendment. Uh, the first column is where we stood after the July amendment and the new uh, proposed post-plan amendment column and the deltas here. You can see uh, that, you know, there's money going into the expansion projects. Uh, uh, 200 of that is for the rolling stock for pin access. The remaining 678 is primarily for 2nd Avenue subway phase 2. There's a couple other very de minimis items in there as well. Um, and that comes from... Um, you know, these loan projects out of uh, New York City Transit, Long Island Railroad, and to a much lesser extent, uh, Metro North and, and uh, MTA bus. And, and really the donor projects are identified by from timing considerations. So there's projects where the movement of the funding won't slow down the projects. Because as I said before, we anticipate the, the award of this federal grant in the fall that could be, you know, as high as $1.4 billion that will allow us to pay back this donation. So we identified projects that we can continue to advance and work on um, and won't be affected uh, by the, uh, you know, the temporary displacement of, of funding authority for those reasons. No changes to bridges and tunnels, as you see, and the bottom line envelope of the program remains the same. And now I'll turn it over to Kevin to talk about the funding. Thanks, Tim. Um, and fairly straightforward amendments for funding. The the good news is no net fun, no net funding change for the 20 to 24 program. We are 
looking to both do a minor amendment for 20 to 24, kind of a matching offsetting amendment for 15 to 19 to allocate funds, and I'll go through 20 to 24 uh, first. So federal funding is being increased by 643 million in 2020 through 24. This increase includes additional competitive grants that have been secured. Um, we are also swapping some federal new starts and formula money between the two programs to uh, better accommodate uh, Second Avenue Subway Phase Two, which is being funded under under both programs. And the increase in federal funding by $643 million, which I'll show you in a minute, is going to be fully offset by the same $643 million reduction of federal funding in 15 to 19. So essentially moving some federal funding forward from 15 to 19 into 20 to 24. And then we're going to be reducing uh, bonding in 2024 by uh, the same uh, the same amount. And here on this chart shows what we're doing in 15 to 19, which is really just the mirror image. Federal funding is being decreased by 643 million and MTA bonds are being increased by 643. So simple way to think about it, again, because you know both programs are active, both programs have Second Avenue Subway Phase Two. We're just um, moving some federal money from 15 to 19 into 2024 and moving some bonding from 2024 into 15 and 19. Net effect, no increase in funding, no increase in MTA bonds issued. And you know, both, both programs have the same, same size envelope. So next steps is uh, taking the, uh, you know, the full plan amendment to the board tomorrow, um, assuming uh, it receives board approval, it would be presented to CPRB uh, immediately thereafter, which would put us on the calendar for the 30-day, uh, you know, deemed approved schedule that the CPRB uh, in the main practices uh, in Albany for, uh, for approval in late July of this year. Questions, comments? Ms. Ms. Barbas. Well, it's good to see um, the efforts to optimize the funding and the scheduling of projects. So that's good to hear that's happening. I'm curious, what is the um, innovation of the overcoating that you said will extend durability? I believe it was Park Avenue. I'm not sure what the project was on the screen. It, it's, it's for the ele elevated transit projects. It utilizes sort of standard, industry standard paint specification. The paint uh, testing process under the old transit specification took several months to ensure that the paint was made to specification. So we've aligned with sort of industry best practices and quality paint, which is both more readily available and doesn't require that internal testing process, which can delay the project. Also, it utilizes, you know, uh, in addition to paint, um, it utilizes caulking of, of certain services that are more exposed to potential uh, corrosion over the years, which makes the protection, you know, the, the first you strip off the old paint, you get down to the steel, you see what steel needs to be repaired, you repair the steel paint, and this is an additional layer of protection upon the paint, which will extend the useful life. Okay, and surface prep is the most important thing. Yeah, we, 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 yeah, we're actually going down further in terms of surface prep than we typically did as well, and using power tools to do that, not just hand tools. And, and what I love about this, for just a kibitz on, on what Tim's saying, is that we're one of the goals of C&D as a consolidation of all the capital program construction expertise and engineering expertise for the capital program was to take advantage of expertise in between agencies, and so this is adapting some of the special know-how that is developed in the bridges and tunnels world, where they're painting and repainting every day, all day, uh, into uh, to use them on our transit structures, getting some you know center of excellence usefulness out of bridges and tunnels in that respect. Other questions or comments, Mr. Chu. I will say this will also make the leadership of the 
DC9 and this is a union that represents the painters very happy. This is something they've brought up to me uh, on, on a couple of occasions. And we were, and, and they've mentioned, we were the only agency that didn't have that particular process. And uh, uh, I, um, I'll be glad to be able to report back and say, see, it happened. Uh, Mr. Sh Mr. Solomon. Thank you very much. Um, a related question on the overcoating in terms of um, the amount and the number of stations. I think it was, you know, in the chart that was shown or the table, it showed about um, 878 million going into the core. But just curious about the shift into that particular uh, item on the overcoating. And if you don't have it now, we can follow the, up. The, the overcoating shift is within transit. I don't have the specific number, but it really reflects that this more intensive process, right, is driving a higher price to those projects. So we're doing a lot of steel repair and overcoat uh, painting projects, um, but we are experiencing a little price inflation, and that requires us to sort of put additional money towards those projects to fund that higher level of useful life that we're going to get out of those completed projects. Um, second question, basically, on the the overall structure of this, as you explained it, was um, about sort of, you know, quote unquote, borrowing from projects and taking advantage of certain timing um, uh, with certain projects. Um, this is all in anticipation that um, we are, um, we receive favorable results on these grant applications that we have. If they do not come through, What's the plan at that point to give back to the donor projects what was taken? Well, you know, over the course of a, a, a plan, both 2024 and historically plans, when projects get deferred out of that plan period, they're really first in line for the next plan to receive funding and get executed, right? Uh, unless they were deferred because they were unneeded or because a technology had changed and there was a different solution to the problem. So, you know... Uh, I, I think projects that don't get res their funding restored do the Fed uh, State Partnership grant uh, receipt, you know, later in the fall, or we don't have additional funds from other competitive grants that come in that help reflect that restoration, the, you know, those projects will be really first in line for the next capital plan in terms of priority needs. But I, I just would, I, I will add, because it's, it's just a reality that, that particular grant application is not a you know a generic competitive grant under you know the federal programs. There were as as uh, the, as USDOT is well aware, it was central to the agreement that was achieved, brokered by Senator Schumer between Amtrak and the MTA to resolve a number of issues. One to let Penn Access go forward, and two to uh, uh, to make sure that uh, the there was a resolution of a cost allocation debate about, um, between the MTA and Amtrak about the East River tunnels. So there is a f full awareness at FRA and the grants making decision makers that the centrality of that grant application supported by Sen Senator Schumer to key uh, projects that they have supported moving forward. So I'm optimistic. We don't know the exact number. But uh, I'm optimistic that that, that, that uh, grant application will meet with some success. And it's all about leveraging acceleration. You know, plan, plan Amendment 1 and Plan Amendment 2 allowed us to award PIN access in December 21. So we're 18 months into design and actually actively involved in construction and replacing interlocking with a long-term outage. If we had waited for the grant and the results before we proceeded with that project, you know, uh, the East Bronx would, you know, have had a long, a much longer wait for those that newly uh, and well-deserved uh, transit access. Mr. Solomon. Thank you for that. And certainly I think we're all in favor of taking, um, you know, advantage of, of, of timing. It's a very much a dynamic plan. Certainly the Crow um, audit said you should look at it every year and make changes. Um, I, I would just note as well, and I hope that we're tracking this, which is that um, the reductions from each of the respective agencies, I understand, still follows the 75-25 split that has been traditional. So as we are looking at taking advantage of this timing, the question then becomes when all is said and done, 
are we still at that 75-25 split between transit and between, uh, between the commuter lines that I think we all just want to make sure stays intact. So as the money moves around, how is that being tracked? What's returned? What was put, what was put in the parking lot for a second, but now, uh, you know, needs to come back to life? Could you use please as a transit analogy? <laughs> Go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. We, you know, we have meticulous detail of, of, of what, what the donor projects are and what their status is and what that allows us to bring them back in proportionally when we have the opportunity to restore funds and sort of fi size the final envelope of the 2024 plan. Mr. Bringerman. More mundane question. Uh, regarding the overcoating project, do we do controlled inspections after the installation? Yeah, we do. We do inspections during the process, uh, uh, as well as as well as uh, acceptance tests is when it's completed. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And some some contracts we've experimented with third party independent testing as well. Okay, well that's, that's kind of what I was getting at, like a controlled. Yeah. You know, from my construction background, it was mostly with fireproofing, and we always had to have a controlled inspector come in after the fact to verify that we had enough thickness on the uh, on the steel. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? Committee loves paint. Um, it's my, uh, this is a big, it's big action here. So I'm, I'm going to call for a. It's not on one. It's going to the full board. Going to the full board. Well, just FYI, we'll be calling for action. <laughs> Thank you. Tomorrow. Um, all right. Procurement. No, DDCR. Please, Tracy Mitchell. Hi, next slide. Great, so this is a snapshot of MW, DBE, and SDVOB from the federal and state projects just for the capital projects. So for the first grid, um, there was a total of $1.6 billion. And this is only talking about from the period October 22 to March of 2023. On the federal level, it will not end for the year until September 30th. Um, it's also important to note that for the federal payments for the DBEs, it's based on awards. And our goal is 20%. And right now, you can see, based on the 1.6 billion, 200 million has been awarded. So that gives us a 13% towards the 20% goal. I put the payments there of the 144, but were viewed and measured against the payments, I mean, the awards. For the New York State MBE, uh, so far for the whole year, April of 2022 to March of 2023, there was a billion dollars awarded. Now, on the state projects, were measured against payments. So if you look at the total payments of the $1.3 billion uh, versus the 195 that was spent on MBE, it was 15% towards our goal, right? So MBE, WBE is 15% on the $1.3 billion, $187 million was spent, so that's 15%. Um, Overall, for the MTA, we're exceeding the goal for last year of 30%. We're currently at 37%. The highest in three consecutive years have exceeded the goal. And then on the last one for the uh, disabled vets, um, two, 10 million was paid based on 518 million payments, which 2%. But statewide, usually one trends 2 to 3%. But I can say for MTA for last year, which ended March of 2023, we were at 5%, which is the highest we've ever been for disabled vets. That concludes my report. Can you just explain on the federal DBE side mm -hmm. the issue of uh, allocations within design build contracts because right. that because in, in that that that's one of the sort of the tracking issues that Correct. we're all uh, struggling with go ahead right so it's based on awards but 
with bid build contracts, uh, once it's awarded, a developer would send us a utilization plan which names all of the firms, MWBEs, DBEs, that they are going to utilize. In design build, we don't know that, right? They don't know that. So we've allowed them to use TBDs to be determined. So that's the struggle with design build versus bid build. The initial stages of design build, it looks like your numbers are lower. It's lower. And we're because trying to convince the federal government to give if you allocate a particular subcontract to MW or SDVOB for them to acknowledge that that will meet your goal, correct? Exactly, so, to count the TBDs, but it's still unknown. Yeah, so that's still a, a debate in progress mm -hmm. with our, our federal overseers, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, a, that's one thing that's going on. Yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments on this issue? Okay. Um, on to procurements, Mr. Plachaki. Your swan song, sir. Good afternoon. Construction and Development is presenting 13 procurement actions totaling $30.5 million to the Capital Program Committee for approval this month. The procurement package includes the following five competitive actions. The award of four personal services contracts for MTA Bridges and Tunnels 2023 biennial bridge inspections and the modification to the 8th Avenue CBTC signal modernization contract to mitigate a design risk identified by the independent safety assessor. There are also eight ratifications for the following items. A modification to the Metro North Railroad Hudson Line Wayside Communications and Signal System Express Cable Installation Contract to address changed conditions and an unanticipated method for installing new fiber optic cable. A modification to provide additional construction phase support services and an extension of the contract term by nine months to support the Culver Line CBTC contract two modifications to the bus radio contract that respectively provide for a the design and construction of new a new base station equipment shelter at the East New York train yard and b additional prototyping work associated with additional bus types identified after contract award and four modifications to the contract for sandy repair and flood mitigation at the 207th street yard that provide for installation of redesigned pile foundations and an additional flood wall and the reconfiguration of new wayside equipment to comply with appropriate train clearance requirements. All of these items are described in detail in the staff summaries contained within your committee books, and I submit these procurement actions for your consideration and vote. Thank you. Any questions or comments on any of these? Uh, all right. Um, I'll take a motion to approve all of them. I'd like to go forward. Are we, am I misunderstanding? Yep. Who, anybody want to move it? Yep. Mr. Solomon, Mr. Chu, second. All in favor? Any opposition or abstention? Okay, we all those are uh, items are approved. I, I have to say this is I was kidding before, but this is the last time we're going to have the the benefit of having Steve Plachaki present to uh, us as a board. And I just, I, I had, a, I had a, the great joy and pleasure of being able to roast him at a retirement party last week. Um, there were a lot of things said that I won't repeat. Um, and, um, but, um, but it, th that was fun. But it was also uh, uh, a moment, of, as, I, as I said, a bittersweet moment because there's nobody who sort of uh, represents the professionalism of some key senior and long-serving MTA employees than Steve Plachaki, who always managed, as we say, to make procurement exciting. So we are so grateful to you um, for, for, for it, because you brought your A game every day, but also for the inspiration you gave in doing that to everybody else around you. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to keep it short. We're running late. It's been my absolute distinct pleasure and honor to have served this company for 35 and a half years. Thank you all. All right. Well, that concludes today's agenda. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? Second. The item matters adjourned.